Welcome to Cars Yeah, show number 335. You may have a great idea, but in, you can't do it alone. You need always need a collaborative effort with other people. This is Cars Yeah, where you'll enjoy interviews with inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Mark Green is here to provide you with a fuel injection of automotive inspiration. So get in, sit down, buckle up, and get ready for a wild ride here on Cars Yeah. Do you know the best way to protect your vehicle, both the exterior and interior, is with a car cover? I've been using Covercraft car covers since 1975. It's a fast, easy, and inexpensive way to keep your vehicle looking new. 2015 marks Covercraft's 50th anniversary. They've manufactured premium quality exterior and interior covers here in the United States with a reputation for durability and design. They're the world's largest manufacturer of custom patterned vehicle covers that are crafted to fit with over 80,000 patterns and growing. You can choose from dozens of fabric options and accessories, all designed and carefully sewn for your special vehicle. Made in the USA, Covercraft is the right choice. I've protected my special rides with their covers for over 40 years, and you should too. Learn more today at Covercraft.com. Hello, automotive enthusiasts. I am revved up and so excited to introduce today's very special guest, Richard Elsliger. Richard, are you buckled up and ready for a fun ride? Sure am. I got my Ray belt, a Ray Brown belt on and cinched. <laughs> very cool. And, and uh, one thing our listeners may want to know, I'm actually talking to Richard in his car today, so uh, everything is very appropriate here for cars. Yeah, I love it. Richard Elsliger is an automotive fiction author who lives in Chicago, Illinois, and writes at every available opportunity. He grew up in the east end of Toronto, an area known as the hotbed of muscle cars, throughout the 60s, 70s, and 80s. He remembers his father's 32 Ford hot rod that was stored in the backyard as a key element of his childhood. Richard's automotive passion manifests itself in his fictional horror stories about cars and the characters who drive them including titles such as Road Closed, Transfusion, and Drag Lake. You'll find his stories in their ebook form on Amazon's Kindle website. Richard, I've told our listeners just a little bit about you. Would you take a moment and share some more about your life and career and, of course, your passion for automobiles? Sure thing. As you mentioned, I grew up in Toronto, Canada during my formative years. And uh, there I went to the University of Toronto and received an undergraduate degree in political science. And, of course, that doesn't really really lead anywhere, so I got restless and decided I wanted to uh, go to law school. So I ended up going to law school at Southern Illinois University and getting my Juris Doctor there back in 1989. But all during that time, I'd been uh, passionate about cars, always had something interesting to, uh, to drive as a general rule. When I graduated from law school, I mean, it kind of went dormant for a while, but uh, when my dad and I went to a Shelby Mustang or a SAC convention, Shelby American Automobile Club convention back in 1993, it got ignited in, a, in the worst way as you can ever imagine. <laughs> and uh, they had six R models there in a row, and it just like it was breathtaking to see. And I remembered how much I really loved cars, and it's been going strong ever since without any diminishing uh, the interest in that area of my life. You know, I just got back from uh, Pebble Beach, and they had a whole lineup of Shelby Mustangs there. It was so cool to see them lined up on the lawn, and I had a 66 uh, GT350 Shelby Mustang. It was a clone, not the real deal, many years ago, but I loved driving that car, as I mentioned in our pre-show check chat here that, uh, boy, I couldn't go anywhere without having friends driving that car around. So what I love about having you on the show today is you're an attorney, you're a lawyer, but you figured out a way to do something around cars. And before we get into some of the questions here, what got you going on writing these stories? You know, I was riding the train into work one day back in the late 90s, and I was, I was thinking about cars. I was thinking about Shelby's and By then, my dad and I had gone to get a 66 Shelby Mustang from Covina, California, from a seller, and it was just a rolling chassis. So I've had that car since 1994. It's finally been finished. There's been a long restoration on it. But, you know, I always liked the Shelby Mustangs, and it was always a dream of mine, even when I was 10 or 11 years old, to own one. And even my friend in high school, Dan, he would draw pictures in my yearbook of 
me tearing down the road in a 65 or 66 Shelby Mustang with side exhaust blasting. I just got to think, you know, I, I like writing stories. I always did, you know, writing short stories, horror, that sort of thing. I wondered how I could maybe meld the two together into some sort of a horror format because I love horror movies. I love supernatural type of movies and science fiction. So sitting on the train, I decided to just take a pen and a piece of paper. I started to write. And the first story I started to write was about a missing R model. There's an R model out there called SFM Shelby Ford Mustang 5R529. And if you go to the Shelby registry, that car has been missing since 1966. Mm. Nobody knows anything about where that car is. It just drops off the face of the earth. So I thought that might make an interesting subject for a story, and I started to write. Cool. Right about this mystery, missing Mustang. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, we're going to learn more about these stories as we move on. But as we continue on your journey, I always like to start by asking my guests for a success quote. It's a really great way to get the inspirational tires turning here on Cars. Yeah. So, Richard, I know you're sitting there in the driver's seat, so take the wheel. Sure am. I, there are a number of quotes that I like to live my life by, but one that really stands out in my mind at the moment is uh, one by Michelangelo. And it goes basically as follows. Um, the greatest danger for most of us is not that our aim is too high and we miss it, but that it is too low and we reach it. Uh-huh. And I found that rather profound, and I, you know, it makes me think about it. You've got to really aim high in this life, and even if you miss it, that's okay. I mean, you're not destined to succeed in everything you aim at, but if you aim low and reach it, you're really not going as far as what your potential could be realized. You know, that's the first time I've heard that quote here on Cars. Yeah, out of 335 guests, I love that quote, of course. Michelangelo, wonderful artist, incredible person, but uh, I love that. That is great, something to live by for sure. Would you share with me a story that instigated your passion for cars? You know, in my intro, we talk about that 32 hot rod your dad had, but is there a pivotal moment in your life when you really knew you were a car guy? I think it was that moment. That car, that 32 Ford, was in my grandmother's backyard. My grandmother raised me for an infant. And that's my dad's mother. And he had that 32 Ford. It was a red five-window coupe in my grandmother's backyard from the time I was born for at least 30 years. It sat in that backyard. And I always went out to play. And I'd always see that red 32. It was in two pieces. Why, I have no idea. He took it apart. I guess he was going to redo it. Uh, I There are pictures of him actually kissing the, the backlight of the car, the, the, the <laughs> rear window of the car as he's waxing it, because he loved that car. Yeah. And it sat there, and it always intrigued me, you know, what is that fit in there? It looks amazing, but I wonder why it's not driving. And from as far back as I can remember, I've always been interested in cars. And then, of course, Hot Wheels came out in the late 60s, and, you know, I had all the, the major Hot Wheels cars to play with and the Hot Wheel tracks and that sort of thing. And it just seemed to fit. It just, you know, it attracted my interest. Wonderful. I love it. Yeah, I was a Hot Rod, Hot Wheels and a Matchbox kid myself. So. Yeah, I had many, many, still have most of them in my closet somewhere back there. What I'd love to do now is crawl under the hood and talk a little bit about a challenge or even a great failure that you faced along the way. Maybe it was something having to do with your career in law, or maybe it was something to do with writing these books. But the most important part of this has to do with how did you overcome that situation and what did you learn from it? Well, I think the biggest challenge I had was a... uh a case that I was given by the firm I was working at. I did insurance defense work, so I did a lot of auto cases, premises liability, trip and falls. But uh, I was given a case on a Friday to try, which was a small municipal case, and it was my first case in front of a jury. Well, I tried the case, and I was successful at it. But on Monday, I had this gigantic law division case that they threw at me, and I had nobody helping me on it. I was going to be the first chair lawyer, and it was a large case. Ultimately, they asked for five hundred thousand uh, dollars. The plaintiff did, and I was defending uh, this woman who had parked her car. Actually, had dis- was a disabled car on a road in broad daylight, and she had her hood up and her four-way flashers on. Well, this plaintiff's lady, she w- went and ran right into the car. Mm-hmm. During the deposition, I was able to take the deposition of the plaintiff. That was the person who's suing, and I asked her pointed questions. I couldn't understand why she would rear-end a car in broad daylight, whether it had its four-way flashers on or not. And I asked her, how, how fast were you traveling when you first saw my client's car? And she said, 25 miles per hour. I asked, how fast were you traveling at the time you impacted my client's car? <laughs> and she said, 25 miles an hour. And I asked her, well, how many seconds went by from the time you first saw my client's car until the time you impacted it? 
And she said, oh, about four seconds. Well, I left it at that, and her lawyer at the end, he did a redirect or recross of, of the deposition, and he reinforced those, those points that I had made. Well, I saved that for trial, and what I did was, when I asked her those questions, in closing, what I did was, I said, well, she was doing 25 miles an hour at the time she saw my client's vehicle. She was doing 25 miles per hour at the time she impacted. That means either she didn't apply her brake or her brakes failed. So either way, I mean, she did nothing to stop. Right. So she, that, that's why she impacted. I also did a mathematical calculation of how far she would have traveled at 25 miles per hour over four seconds. And it turned out to be 36.66 feet per second for a total of 146 feet traveled. I took out a tape measure in front of the jury and I pulled it along. The, the plaintiff's lawyer jumped up and down and he objected. He said it wasn't a scale and the judge said, it's ridiculous, the tape measure is going to be admitted. And I said, I pulled it out for about 50 feet and it went from one end of the courtroom to the other. And I said, imagine this, uh, like three times this distance that she had to stop and she did nothing and she uh, hit my client's wheel. Well, I got a defensive verdict anyway, so that was my big uh, moment in uh, auto case liability and trying cases. Sure. Now, as far as the challenge part, what, what was what was difficult about that? Was it just the fact that it was so absurd or? It was, it was absurd, but there were jury verdicts out there where people, where plaintiffs were getting recoveries where they, where they hit a stopped vehicle. So, yeah. I mean, it could have gone either way, but of course my lawyer buddy said, oh, well, there was no other way it could have gone. I mean, that was an easy case for you to win. So, I mean, they tried to detract from me, but, you know, it could have gone either way, and uh, you just never know who's going to be on a jury. I mean, nothing's assured in a, in a trial. Oh, absolutely. And you take big chances, you know. If, if you don't offer any money and you try the case, you're taking a big chance you get hit with a big verdict. It was Cook County, Illinois, and they're known for big plaintiff verdicts. And uh, yeah. yeah, and it was my first big case they ever tried. So I, it was an amazing challenge for me. Oh, Nerve wracking. I'll bet. I'll bet. Well, let's shift gears here and go to the other end of the spectrum. I'd love for you to share maybe one of those aha moments that happened in your career, a time when the headlights came on, as I like to say, and illuminated your way for this new idea or your, this new direction you had. And, and tell me the steps that you took to turn that aha moment into a success. As I mentioned before, I liked writing fiction, and uh, I was starting to meld automobiles into the horror genre. At the time I wrote that book with uh, the R model, the missing R model, I had known that Stephen King had written something called Christine, and somebody had alerted me to that, and I'm thinking, "Uh uh-oh, I hope my story isn't paralleling Stephen King's Christine. So I went and read Christine, and I felt comfortable. Well, you know, his is a supernatural car, but mine has a a different bent to it, so... Mm -hmm. You know, in my mind, nobody has has exclusive ex- exclusivity over writing automotive related horror. And he's written a few. He's written, I believe, from a Buick Eight, which I read, and uh, Riding the Bullet, which is very good as well. But you know, mine's also in a different genre of horror. It's sometimes supernatural highways, sometimes a supernatural car or supernatural being that drives these cars and influences people's lives. But my aha moment was, you know, having accumulated these stories, these short stories that I wrote. There's really nothing I could do. I mean, they, were, they would sit on slush piles, as they're called, at the publishers' houses, and I would never hear back for months. Yeah. With the advent of uh, the Kindle and eBooks, which started to become popular, that was my aha moment that maybe I can actually try to get this done as an eBook and not incur the huge costs of printing, or you know, be at the mercy of a publisher to get this printed and get it out to the public. And uh, my aha moment was that, and and then. Finding a cover artist, Michael Graham, that does the cover work for my, he does brilliant work, find the cover artist. And when it finally got up online, I realized, wow, I'm published and I'm online through Amazon. (laughs) It's so cool. I've had so many authors here on Cars, yeah, and many of them have self-published. They can get out there and produce things that in the past would have cost a fortune or maybe would have never happened or in the case of Many times they would do all the work and then the publisher would end up taking all the money and they really wouldn't have anything at the end of the day. So it's really cool what you're doing. I think it's really fun. And are you going to give away the secret? Where did that missing R go? Nobody knows. <laughs> <laughs> I, I sometimes tease them on the Shelby American Automobile Club website. Too, but as soon as I type in 5R529, it gets a ton of hits because all these guys, everybody's looking for it. And nobody right. knows where it is. I didn't never know. I mean, it, it was sold in New Jersey in '66, 
And then its current whereabouts are unknown. That's exactly how it reads in the registry. And I don't know if anybody's ever going to know. And I like that kind of a mystery. Yeah, I was wondering if the book you wrote, is the book about that car, about the Mustang? It is about that car, so, but it's a supernatural car. Okay, I thought maybe in your book you finally revealed where the car ended up. It, it ends up, if somebody finds it in Wisconsin. It's oh. a kid who wants to go racing with it, and it teaches him the road I wrote America how to be a great, great race driver, but there's a huge price to pay. Oh, yeah, dancing with the mm -hmm. devil, as they say. Pretty much. <laughs> Pretty much. Very cool. I love it. I assume you've had many proud moments in your career and in your writing career as well, but is there one in particular that stands out for you that you'd share with me today? It sure does. When I first saw the, the Amazon makes it very easy to get an ebook up on site. It's very user friendly to get something printed in an ebook format. And when I saw it first up on my first book, Road Close, when I saw it up on the, the website and saw the, the cover art there, yeah, that was a very proud moment for me. I realized that uh, I was in business. Yep. And the next proud moment was seeing that uh, some people had bought it and I had got some reviews on it. There you and go. And the reviews were, were pretty positive. Yeah. You know, it's fun. It's like when you build your first website and it goes live and you just look at it and you go, Wow, look at that. I created something out of nothing. And when people start noticing it and enjoying it, uh, that adds another layer of icing to the cake, if you will. Let's have a little bit of fun here. What was your first really special car? And if you could share a memory that you have with that vehicle. Well, that would be my 69 Mustang Coupe. That was my first car. My grandmother, I came from a very car-oriented family. My grandmother always liked a nice car. And she was so anxious for me to learn how to drive. She bought that car for me when I was 14 years old. So I'd had to sit in the driveway for two years. I couldn't drive it. Oh, my gosh. My driver's license. <laughs> so I sat there. It was a, an attractive nuisance, and I was dying to drive that car. I took it out a couple of times, unbeknownst to her. You know, I'd find <laughs> the keys and take it out. And I just had so much fun in that car. But there was one situation I remember driving in Scarborough with my friend Dan in the passenger seat. And there was a guy next to me. I'm pretty sure it was a firebird, and he wanted to race. And we had a long stretch of road ahead. And so as soon as that light turned to green, we both gunned it. And we were both pulling pretty fast and pretty much neck and neck. But then a car way up ahead turned left in front of me uh, to go the same direction. So I had to hit the brake really hard. And what I wasn't aware of was that the drum brakes all around were pulling unevenly. So it pulled hard to the left. Yeah. <laughs> so I had to struggle to get the car under control and ultimately ended up doing 180 degrees into the, the lane of oncoming traffic. Uh -oh. There was no traffic there, fortunately. And the car just sat there humming away, waiting for its next command. <laughs> and my friend and I were just in disbelief. What just happened? Right. There were telephone poles racing to the right, to the left, side to side. I mean, it was, it was harrowing, yeah. but it, we survived. And that was a valuable lesson I learned. It's not, it wasn't the smartest thing to do, but... That's what a 16-year-old boy is going to do when he has a 69 Mustang. Yeah, boys and girls, no street racing out there. Go to the track, go to a club event. and uh, Exactly. Otherwise, you may not end up as lucky as Richard did. Is there a vehicle that you've sold, that you've owned, that went away, that you really wish you had back in the garage? It's that same vehicle. Uh, I mean, it still okay. haunts me in my mind. Sometimes I dream about that vehicle, but I still <laughs> own it, and it's been waiting to be restored. It actually haunts me in my dreams. Oh, my gosh. It wasn't the fastest thing on four wheels, but uh, it was red, and it had the black racing stripes, and it was just my favorite car. I just have so many happy memories with it. I'll bet. How about a vehicle that you purchased that pretty soon afterwards you thought to yourself, what was I thinking? That would be a BMW Bavaria 1974. Uh, it had dual carburetors on it. They were impossible to tune. It had rust issues on it. Uh, it was a four-door, so I went from a two-door Mustang to a four-door BMW Bavaria. It, it handled fairly decently, but it had all kinds of engine problems and body problems and quality problems. I remember driving the car on the highway once, and the actual BMW logo off the hood went flying from a guy must have been taken up by the air and it went ping against the windshield. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. Maybe it was a little bit haunted. <laughs> in some yeah, no way. doubt. No doubt. How about current projects? Is there something you're working on right now? Is there another book coming along in your future? Uh, there are books. I got a couple more in the pipe. One's about a, a drag racer that finds this uh, car that has the ability to keep him young forever. Oh my gosh! So he cool. has to he has to keep moving from state to state. When his girlfriends start to get wise, that why doesn't he age? How come you still look so good? 
then he realizes he has to move on with his car. So ah. he just moves from relationship to relationship and then starts a new life. Very cool. Quite an imagination. In, a, in addition to that, I'm working on a clothing line I call Trendheart, T-R-E-A-D-H-E-A-R-T. It's a logo I created. I was watching a show on Pirates of, uh, back in 2012. And uh, they, I, I saw pirate flags. I thought it'd be nice if I had my own Jolly Roger. And I started to sketch something that would be, that would fit with the modern era. So I drew this heart, and then I drew a pair of tire treads over the heart, and I called it Tread Heart. And I, more recently, decided to spin it into a clothing line of polo shirts, hats, driving gloves, and that sort of thing. So I created a website where I market my uh, clothing line in addition to uh, my other activities. Very cool. Well, entrepreneur you are, and that's another thing I love about having people like you on the show is that entrepreneurial spirit, always creating something new, bringing something new to market. I love that. That's very cool. I didn't know that about you. Treadheart.com, actually, if I can interject here, so that's the website. So if anybody's interested, you can peruse it. Absolutely. And at the end of the show, we'll uh, bring that up again and and, uh, of course, on your show notes page, we'll have links to that website and links to Amazon where people can find your books as well. Here's a very introspective question for you, Richard. If you were a car, what kind of car would you be and why? Oh, that's easy. It'd be a 65 <laughs> Shelby GT 350R model. Uh, maybe maybe the Essex Wire, which was Rick Kopech's car for quite some time. Oh, okay. uh, The reason being that... Uh, it's a car that's universally recognized as a Mustang, mm -hmm. but not everybody knows about its special features. So yeah. the car is special, but it has a mass appeal. Um, the Essex Wire is even uh, kind of a rebel rouser in the Shelby world of race car models because that car didn't have the blue stripes. It had one solid, thick black stripe down the center with two thin caramel stripes on either side of the black stripe. So they kind of you know, they rejected Shelby's standard of white with blue stripes. They did their own thing, and they put Essex Wire on the side. And I'm sure it made old man Shelby angry that they that <laughs> they took the blue stripes off and put their own on, but that was their business, and uh, it made it special. So that's something that – that's the kind of car I'd like to be. And it's proven its point. I mean, it proved its point in the 60s. It doesn't have to race anymore. So it just sits there and, and uh, makes people happy. You know, I told you in our pre-show chat when I had mine – I couldn't get gas without it being a 20, 30-minute affair because little kids, grandmas, grandpas, wives, dads, whomever would come over and want to talk to me, and everyone had their own story about someone in their family or a friend who had a Mustang at some point in time. It was an instant friend maker, that car. They really are. They're just so fabulous. Oh, yeah. Well, Very currently cool. I have a 66 uh, Hertz, and it's red with the gold stripes, so it's got the West Coast colors. And nice. Yeah, yeah, it's hard to get out of a gas station when you go to get gas. Yeah, they're But awesome. I don't mind. It's fun to let people see them. You know, it gets people into the car culture. Absolutely, absolutely. So, Richard, up next is the last lap. But before we put the pedal to the metal, let's say thank you to today's Cars Yeah sponsor. Have you turned your key and heard that dreaded tick, 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 tick because of a dead battery? No worries. I've got the NOCO Genius Boost Jump Starter. This compact tool fits in your glove box and features rechargeable lithium battery technology that will start a dead battery in your car, boat, truck, or RV. It packs a whopping 12-volt, 400-amp starting power and can start up to 20 dead batteries on a single charge. Plus, it has built-in spark-proof technology with reverse polarity protection to safely jumpstart your vehicle. The compact, ergonomically designed clamps are solid copper for maximum conductivity, and there's a built-in ultra-bright dual LED flashlight with seven modes, including an SOS emergency strobe. It's easily rechargeable with a USB outlet, and you can charge your smartphone or tablet while you're on the road. Works on any 12-volt lead-acid battery. The Genius Boost from NOCO is the ultimate emergency tool that's safe and easy to use. Quality design, state-of-the-art technology from NOCO, your battery care source since 1914. Get yours at GeniusChargers.com. Okay, Richard, we're back and we're entering the last lap, and this is where I'm going to fire off a series of questions and ask you to give our listeners some very quick blips of the throttle answers. So you ready? Sure, fire away. All right, here we go. What is the best automotive advice you've ever received? I would say that's probably from my father. I mean, he's big into cars. He had an Olds Rocket 88. He had that 32 Ford five window. He told me something to the effect of cars can get you into a lot of trouble, Richard, but they can get you out of trouble just as fast. He told me to respect the machinery. So, in other words, he's saying, 
just be careful how you drive it and keep the shiny side up. <laughs> Absolutely. Take care of your machinery. Could you share one of your personal habits that you believe has contributed to your success over the years? Yeah. What I like to do is uh, when I get an idea, I like to write it down on a scrap of paper or put it on the phone or put it in the computer, and I keep it in a safe place. And then I like to revisit that idea. Even if it's a dream, if I dream of something at night, like an idea or a concept for a story, I'll, I'll wake myself up. You know, if I can wake up out of the dream, and I'll, I will actually write it down at 3 a.m. because I don't want to forget it. You know, yeah. if I wake up in the morning and then you forget your dream, well, then it's gone forever. Right. So that's what I like to do. I like to document it, and then I revisit it to see if it's something that, in my mind, is viable. If it's not, then I'll just discard it, and if it is, then I'll go with it. Yeah, you know, it's a great idea, a great habit to have. I go for a walk every day, and sometimes my mind will wander, and I come up with these ideas, and if I don't uh, record it, I bring my smartphone and just talk into it. If I don't do that, by the time I get back, sometimes I've forgotten that great idea. Maybe it wasn't so great, but it's a nice thing to do is to uh, write those ideas down and keep them somewhere safe. I love that word safe that you use. That was great. Is there a resource that you think the Cars Yeah listeners would really enjoy? Sure. If you like uh, Shelby Mustangs or you like Cobras, uh, you can visit SAC's website, the Shelby American Automobile Club. I think it's SAC.com. And uh, Cobra Automotive, they, they do a lot of good supplies as far as parts for engines and uh, lug nuts. I put the Trans Am lug nuts on my 66, which I love. Oh, yeah. I just love the look of those long columbar lug nuts that stick out from the torque thrust that I got on the car. Yeah. It's got a tough look to it, yeah. Yeah, I did that on mine. Yeah, it looks cool. It looks like a race car, so very nice. Oh, yeah. Now, other than your books, of course, is there a book that you'd like to share with our listeners you think they would really enjoy reading? Sure thing. There's one that sticks out in my mind. It would be Cannonball by Brock Yates. It's actually... the he wrote and pieced together various stories of the cannonball runs from the mid to late Mm seventies. And I found it very, very entertaining. And it gives you a real insight as to what actually went on during the cannonball runs from coast to coast. Oh yeah. Those uh, seventies races that they had, those illegal races. Yeah. Great book. I love that book. It's awesome. I'll remind our listeners, you can find links to all these great resources at carsyacom slash Richard. Elsliger, and Richard's last name is spelled E-L-S-L-I-G-E-R. Do you have any interesting hobbies outside of your passion for cars? Uh, I play the piano. My grandmother pushed me into it uh, at a very early age. I didn't want to learn how to play, but I learned, but now I don't regret it. So I play, yeah. Yeah, I play classical music, and I write some music. I've written 10 pieces for piano, mostly preludes. Oh. I'd say maybe four of the ten are okay. You know, I'm not an expert at it by any stretch of the imagination. Very creative. All right, we're up to the checkered flag here, Richard, and this last question can be a real doozy. If you could only have one collector car in your garage, but this is something you can't sell to buy a bunch of other cars with, so that little trick's off the table. But don't worry about the price, because today I'm going to write the check. What would that one vehicle be and why? You know what I, what I initially thought was would be a Shelby Cobra Dragon Snake. They only made seven of them. One of them was a 427. The others were 289s. Uh-huh. But then I thought better of it, so I moved to amend my idea, my thought. And I'm thinking a 32 Ford five-window coupe oh. that's red so I could share it with my father and let him have an opportunity to relive some of his happier days in the 50s when he had that car. So You threw me a curve there. I did. Yeah, you <laughs> did. Well... I threw myself a curve, actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's really great that you picked a car that meant something to your father. That's absolutely fantastic. Tell me a little bit more about what that car would look like, maybe how it's powered. How would you set it up? His car was red, and it had it was open wheels. There were no fenders on it, and he had the Ford flathead with all those little acorns on it, those acorn nuts, and uh, he had the Stromberg carb- carburetors on it nice. and uh, the grill. And uh, it was slightly jacked up in the back. It was a trunk car, not the rumble seat. And uh, it just looked like an amazing machine. Yeah. Oh, what fun. What fun. Yeah, you did throw me there. I thought for sure we'd be talking some special uh, uh, Shelby or Cobra or something like that. But uh, very nice. I love that. Richard, you've taken me on a great ride today. And I've really enjoyed your stories. And I want to thank you for sharing your journey with the Cars Yeah listeners and with me. Could you give us one parting piece of guidance before you and your dad drive off into the sunset in that 32 Ford? Yeah, sure thing. Uh, you may have a great idea, but in, you can't do it alone. 
you need always need a collaborative effort with other people. And my stories are a great example of that because I need that cover artist. I'm not an artist myself. I can't draw. So without that collaborative effort, uh, you really can't do it alone. You always need others to help. Uh, Ken L. Shelby was the same. I mean, he had so many people helping him get to where he was. Mm-hmm. Not, I'm not detracting from his ingenuity because he was an automotive genius, but he had a lot of help along the way. And you need those people. You need good people helping you to accomplish your goals. You know, very well said. We are the culmination of the uh, the key people we have around us, and it is so important, that collaboration. I had Peter Brock on this show some time back, and Peter talked about his day with uh, his days with old Carroll Shelby when they were working on the uh, GT350 Mustangs and, of course, the Daytonas, and uh, you're right. I think that's a great parting thought. What's the best way for our listeners to learn more about you to be able to access your books and also this clothing line? Sure. The clothing line, you can go to treadheart, T-R-E-A-D-H-E-A-R-T dot com to see the clothing line, driving gloves, hats, and polo shirts. And for the uh, stories, you can just simply go to Amazon, type in my last name, E-L-S-L-I-G-E-R, and you'll find my books. Awesome. Great. Well, listeners, I encourage you to go to com slash Richard and you just put Richard in the search bar. His show notes page will pop up with links to everything. Check out his books. I think you're going to have a lot of fun reading the, these. The imagination that Richard has and the stories he's woven in and around cars are absolutely wonderful. And I can't wait to go and check out your clothing line as well. That's something you surprised me with today. So I think that's fantastic. Richard, thank you for being so generous today with your time and your expertise and for sharing your journey with the listeners and with me. Until we talk again. I'll see you down the road. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you so much for joining us on today's ride here at Cars Yeah. Drive on over to CarsYeah.com to find show notes and inspiring automotive fun. Download your free copy of Filler Up, a fun book filled with gorgeous photographs of fuel filler fun, including quotes from more inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Download your copy today, and we'll see you next time on Cars Yeah.